Hey, my name is Wadiker and I'm making this video to answer the question, is it possible to beat Monster Hunter World without sharpening your weapon? This idea was inspired by Reaver Jolt on YouTube, who aimed to pull off the exact same challenge in Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate less than a year ago. Ever since I watched that video, I was curious to see if it was possible to do in Monster Hunter World as well, but when I tried searching it up on YouTube, no one else seemed to have tried it at the time. Since then, a YouTuber by the name of The Hunter Project not only beat me to it, but one upped it by aiming to only do assigned quests alongside it. So feel free to go and check out how their run went as well. Regardless, I decided to go through with the challenge anyway, just to see how much harder it could have possibly been compared to the base game. Let's get started with the rules. The most obvious of which is that I'm not allowed to regain sharpness in any way during a hunt. Be it with your standard whetstone or do items like wetfish scales. Additionally, I decided that tenderizing the monster with Iceborne's Clutch Claw is also off limits, since it negates one of the core downsides of my degrading sharpness, which is bouncing. I am still allowed to use all other additions made in Iceborne, however, like any new non tenderizing moves and dunking the monster into walls. For the third rule, I can't use any armor pieces that have skills affecting sharpness, even ones I would never gain a benefit from anyway, like speed sharpening. While it doesn't do anything for my sharpness, I'm lumping the Mind's Eye skill in here too, since it also negates bouncing. The rest of these rules should be mostly self explanatory. No modding, no cheating, no multiplayer, no ranged weapons, of course. As for the win condition, we have to slay the final boss, Xeno Jiva. We start off by watching some award winning lip syncing before creating our Hunter and Palico, whom we named Blunt Barb and Dull Dan, respectively. I was going to make a pun about how Joe the Handler is, but I'm sure her lack of likability here is just an edge case. Suddenly, we get a lift from Zora Magros, who catapults us straight into the middle of the ancient forest, where we end up encountering not only Great Jagras, but Anjanath too. With an unnecessary leap of faith, we move past the game's introduction and onto quite possibly our biggest decision for the run. What weapon are we going to use? Monster Hunter World has 14 unique weapon types, each with their own distinct strengths and playstyles. While all of them would be more than viable choices, only five of these weapons stood out to me when thinking about this challenge. The Greatsword, Hammer, Charge Blade, Longsword, and Jewel Blades. The Greatsword or Hammer would be fantastic due to packing lots of power in as few hits as possible, but the Longsword and Jewel Blades would be great overall for their consistency and easily accessible Mind's Eye built into their kit. As for the Charge Blade, its flat file damage would be an excellent thing to have, and it can be a DPS monster when used effectively. It may seem like I'm spoiled for choice, but this was actually quite an easy thing to narrow down. I was already pretty familiar with the Great Sword Hammer and Charge Blade, so I chose to give them a pass so I could do something fresh. On top of that, I was never really a big fan of the Longsword anyway, leaving me with the Jewel Blades as the obvious choice left. So I slapped those two metal prongs onto my back and quickly headed out to properly start the challenge. Killing seven small Jaggers and eight Cassidon was barely worth mentioning, and so was Great Jaggers to an extent as well. Even with my already shredded sharpness from eight Cassidon earlier, they went down with no problem. When searching for a new camp, we get interrupted by a Kulu Yuku. This bird wyvern has the ability to pull rocks out of the ground, which cause your attacks to bounce, while making their attacks stronger. This may seem like a big problem at first, but shooting a few paws into their backside causes them to drop anything they're holding, making them painless to take down. A Puke Puke we saw earlier is next on the to-do list, and is the new player's introduction to a few more of the game's mechanics that'll be important down the road, namely ailments and several parts. This was the first hunt where I reached the lowest possible sharpness just from fighting the target monster, but even then, I could slay them with ease. I wasn't looking forward to this next quest for two reasons. One, because it's a really boring escort mission that takes forever, and two, because the target monster was one that I feared was going to be the first true wall of this challenge, Baroth. This swampy monster coats itself in copious amounts of mud, resulting in a very tough layer of armor around its entire body. As you can imagine, this shreds through your sharpness like nothing else, and within minutes of the fight starting, I was already in the red. It didn't help that for some reason I decided to kill some Aptonarth earlier in the fight as well for fun, reducing my already pressure sharpness before the fight even began. For more than half the hunt, I was dealing just one damage a hit, making it take absolutely ages to plow through. Overall though, the fight wasn't that difficult, it just took much longer than I'd have liked. Up next was everyone's favorite Piscean Wyvern, Juratotus. This fight was kinda just uninteresting, no real problems, even after reaching red sharpness for the third hunt in a row. Next came Toby Kadachi, one of my favorite monsters in the game who I for some reason completely forgot about until I got this quest. I was expecting this fight to go pretty smooth since I fought Toby a ton in the past, but for the first time in the run I end up fainting not only once, but twice. I was quickly beginning to dread that Toby may end up being a wall I didn't expect, but managed to slay them once I played a little less recklessly and focused more damage on their tail. After fighting Toby, I noticed I was actually just one material away from crafting their jewel blades, which I kinda wanted for the extra affinity and sharpness it gave me. 
I also knew that bonking monsters into walls always made them drop one material they can give. Hey Tober. Hey Tober McGuire. I thought she was about to say, go ahead, shit your pants. Scale, scale, scale. Yeah, boys, let's go! So we craft Toby's jewel blades and move on to the next hunt. Finally, we reach the true early game difficulty check, Anjanath, a monster that I myself got stuck on back when I first played the game on PS4. Honestly? Anjanath gave me almost no troubles here. So many of their preferred fighting areas contain tons of slopes, giving me lots of opportunities to use the jewel blades powerful pizza cutter on them. I suppose now is a good time to mention my gear, as I'm primarily picking pieces based on skills they have. There's one specific skill I'm using that's doing wonders for all these early game hunts, and that's affinity sliding. This skill temporarily increases my affinity by 30% after sliding down a slope, which is a massive boon early game. This is especially true when my sharpness gives me a pretty limited time window to do as much damage as possible to the monster. I know I said Anjanath gave me almost no troubles, but I do faint once after getting stunned. Despite this, they go down with no real struggle. Big Chunky Zora from the very start of the game wants to actually have a go at us now and quite possibly the most intense quest of the game. So intense I spent a decent chunk of it getting a drink instead of actually fighting them, just to calm my nerves. Once I get back, I accidentally hit him with a binder, causing Zora to quite literally eat the dirt. Oh Ooh, he really God. going ham on that drywall though. <laughs> Look at that. Oh my god, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I spend the next five minutes slashing magma cores, meet the flagship monster Nergigante, then finish this super boring scripted story mission. The one good thing about Zora's mission is they end up opening the way to our next locale, the Coral Highlands. I really do love how this locale looks with its underwater aesthetic. Hopefully we'll get to see it again in a future Monster Hunter as well. Either way, I take on Zitsuyaku and Paolumu next. Zitsu is Kulu's blue light mode advocating brother. And Paolumu is the Highlands resident route looking windbag. I take them both down with no problem and get introduced to another new locale already, the Rotten Vale. While the Coral Highlands looks pretty, the Rotten Vale is by far my favorite locale in the base game. Something about it and its monsters just looks so cool and unique. I'm immediately greeted by Radoban, a big bony roly-poly tar monster. You may imagine this monster being a problem considering they're covered in thick bone armor, but the Jewel Blades pizza cutter move yet again cuts straight through them. After slaying them, we then go sight Great Giros, then move back up to the Coral Islands again. This time we're fighting a Legania. Legiana? L Legiana. Either way, it's a big ice-based bird wyvern. The only real problem in their kit is how they can inflict Ice Blight on me, which really screws up my use of the Jewel Blades. In case you don't know, the Jewel Blades can enter a state called Demon Mode, which constantly drains your stamina for as long as you're in it. The benefit, of course, is having access to better, more damaging attacks, so it's more than worth being in most of the time. Meanwhile, Ice Blight makes my stamina drain even faster, which really messes with my flow in this fight. Palamu actually drops into the fight at some point as well, and I take the opportunity to make the two kiss. Overall though, this fight isn't too difficult. Up next is easily my favorite monster in the game, Odegaran. Couple their incredible design with how satisfying they are to fight, and it doesn't surprise me at all how so many people also consider it their favorite monster as well. It would be a little bit worrying if I had trouble fighting Odegaran at this point, but I luckily don't and put the good boy to rest. We quickly encounter Rathalos next, who we need to hunt down so one of the first Vivarians tells us where Zora Magdaros is going. It's impressive that we managed to straight up lose track of a mobile mountain, especially considering they carved their way straight through a ravine. Regardless, we're tasked with hunting both a Rathalos and Diablos in order to get this info. Rathalos ends up being no problem just like the rest so far, but I do get double teamed by him and Anjanath at one point, causing me to faint once during the hunt. Honestly, the most annoying thing about Rathalos is how he tends to give you a full tour of the entire ancient forest every time you hunt him. Still, not too hard of a hunt though. Before tackling Diablos, I decided to go and farm Odegaran for a bit to get some of his gear. I would have loved to go for a full set of his armor, but unfortunately some of the pieces have sharpening skills, meaning we're not allowed to use them. Since this is where the game tends to get quite a bit harder, it's also worth mentioning one of the unexpected rules that comes with this challenge. I haven't mentioned this rule yet, as it isn't really relevant for the first half of the game, but once we start getting into some of the tougher monsters, it's going to make a gigantic impact. We actually aren't allowed to restock items at camps in this run, nor change our gear mid-hunt. 
Entering a camp during a hunt completely restores your weapon sharpness to full again, meaning we have to be absolutely positive we have everything we need in our inventory prior to launching the quest. If we ever run out of healing items, we either have to tough it out or go on a crafting run to make more in the middle of the hunt. Again, this isn't too relevant early on when the biggest threat is a zappy squirrel or flying chicken, but you'll definitely see its effects on the run very shortly. Sadly, what you won't see is my fight against Diablos, Zora Magros, and Hyrak Pookie Pookie. I accidentally screwed up one of my recording sessions of the game, meaning over two hours of footage ended up being completely unusable. I'm mostly frustrated we lost Dora Magdaros, as that's actually our transition into high rank and a pretty important turning point in the run. Regardless, none of these monsters gave me trouble. Diablos wasn't that difficult while using such a mobile weapon, Zora is a story mission you're practically scripted to win, and high rank Pookie Pookie is just Pookie again, but with a bigger health pool. With those three out of the way off screen, our next task was Pink Rathian. Their body is extensively covered in tough armor, and within seconds of the fight starting, my sharpness was already getting worryingly shredded. Like Yana drops in early on and the two start double teaming me, making an already painful fight that much worse. Less than 10 minutes into the hunt, I completely run out of healing items, and since I'm unable to restock at camp, my options are very limited. Luckily, for the first time in Monster Hunter World history, the health booster comes in clutch. Dude, Still health booster it. coming in clutch though! I remember asking about another stream, and just like, yeah, it's, it, it, it's really shitty. Don't you ever talk shit about my boy the health booster ever again. This, combined with Vigor Walsh from Dildan and a second meal, gives me just the right amount of heals to win. Any damage they took caused an instant restart. Okay, I do faint once shortly after, but I still end up taking her down anyway. She was easily the most difficult monster so far, but don't worry, that's going to change very quickly. The Admiral comes in to admire our kill and introduces us to the final location in the base game, the Elder's Recess. Here we go and take a look at every monster that inhabits the area, Dodogama, Uragan, and Lavasioth. We don't need to fight them though, not yet anyway. Finally, we find tracks that Nergigante left behind, swiftly unlocking the quest we need to go and fight him. I jump straight into this quest as soon as I get it, and I have to say, Nergigante was super difficult. He does tons of damage with every hit, has gigantic hitboxes, and worst of all, he gains more armor the longer the fight goes on. I faint less than 10 minutes into the hunt, being unable to superman dive his iconic dive bomb attack. After another 5 minutes of dealing damage, he starts limping back to his nest, having less than 20% of his health left. Little did I know, that last 20% was when this fight would reach its hardest. My sharpness was as low as it could possibly go at this point, and I was dealing an unbearably small amount of damage with each attack. At this point, it was a fight of endurance. Eventually, I was so low on healing items, I had to start chugging herbal medicines to heal. Yeah! You kill him? Yeah. Hey. He is dead. Good job. So now what? Now I gotta go. Three more of the ones like this. Oh no. <laughs> Finally, after a 25 minute long hunt, we succeed in taking down Nergigante. We're not done yet though, as we still have three elders to take down before reaching the final boss. After collecting the elders' tracks, I decide to head out for Valhazak first. The big ol' meaty fart monster that loves chunking your HP anytime you offer us in the meat and he spews out. Overall, I'd say this is one of my favorite monster designs in the world. They're not a particularly hard elder, but they at least have a very neat design. I do end up fainting not too far into the hunt, but to my surprise, Doldan comes in with the Vigor Wasp Revive. It really did take me by surprise, as I must have just unlocked it after beating Nergigante. I unfortunately faint again not too long after, getting my health chunked in half, knocked into the acid water, and then his farts finish the job. The hunt goes solid from there though, and we take him down with technically just one faint. I take the time to farm Nergigante a bit gathering his materials to make new and better armor so I can survive the elders a bit better. After upgrading my gear a bit more, we move on to Teostra next. The biggest thing with Teostra to look out for is the big nuke they do when at full power, which can easily be avoided with just a superman dive or a flash pod if you're carrying them. I do decide it'd be fun to get stunned a couple times here and there, but all in all Teostra was super easy to hunt. Easier than I thought it'd be. With how upgraded my weapon was by this stage, I was only really reaching minimum sharpness once the hunts were almost over. The next elder is the one I was dreading the most, Kushala Deora. As you might be able to surmise from their appearance, their body is covered in armor, and they try their absolute hardest to blow you away. 
despite being as annoying as they always are, they actually go down surprisingly easy. My sharpness didn't even reach the lowest quality, and I didn't faint once. I expected this fight to be far harder than it was. We're finally here, the final boss, Xenojiva. Here was my build going into Xenojiva and the Three Elders, a mix of Nergigante and Odegaran parts primarily picked based on their skills. Health boost is practically a requirement to have, and speed eating is there for convenience. I go headfirst into the fight with Xeno, expecting it to be a free victory lap for the entire run at this point. None of their attacks are particularly difficult to deal with, but can sometimes deal scary amounts of damage if you let them. It only takes about 6 minutes before they head into their second phase, which fooled me into thinking this hunt would finish quicker than I thought. I was super wrong thinking that, as the second phase goes on for over 25 minutes. I do make excessive use of the pizza cutter move here, and manage to get a very stylish tail cut with it too. My sharpness slowly deteriorates over time while I'm taking small chips out of Xeno's health, all the way until we land the killing blow that completes the run. There we go. Can you beat Muscle Hunter World without sharpening your weapon? Of course you can, and it's not even really that hard. Going into this run, I didn't think it was actually going to be that difficult, and it wasn't. Sharpness is always important to maintain in Monster Hunter, but ignoring it doesn't make the game unplayable, or even that much harder. Monsters typically end up dead by the time you even reach minimum sharpness, so most of the difficulty doesn't even come from that aspect of the challenge. What does make this challenge harder was all the restrictions that came alongside the no sharpening rule. Things like not being able to restock, or hunts taking longer than usual making mistakes more likely, etc. Using a weapon I was unfamiliar with also added to the challenge a bit as well. Give it a shot if you're looking for a different way to play through the game, or so you can make excuses as to why you keep forgetting to sharpen your weapon bit hunt Some of you watching with a keen eye may have noticed the length of the video though. How come there's about 9 minutes left if we just beat the challenge? That's because I wasn't satisfied yet. Sure, we can beat Xenojiva without sharpening our weapon the entire game, but midway through the run my end goal changed. Can you beat every monster in the base game without sharpening? Every monster we skipped, only had to look at, or even haven't seen yet, was now on my chopping block, including DLC monsters. Disclaimer though, Behemoth, Kulvtaroth, and Ancient Lashin won't be included here. They're designed to be beaten multiplayer, which goes against the solo only rule that was set for the challenge. Let's get a few monsters out of the way very quickly. Zitsuyaku, Great Geros, and Rathian. All three of these are fully beatable without sharpening to no one's surprise. I did Rathian after beating Xenojiva, but Zitsi and Great Geros I actually hunted way back when the game initially introduced them. Even with my stats at the level they should have been, these are a breeze. Next we'll move on to the big three in the Elder's Recess. Lavasioth, Dodo Gamma, and Uragan. I did Lavasioth first, and it's really hard to forget just how much I don't like this monster. It's not because they're hard or anything, they're not. It's just that they're so lame and boring to fight. I went for Uragan next, which is just Radoban, but came several games prior instead. Effectively the same moveset as them, and not that much harder by comparison. They did give me an oddly creepy grin in their end screen though. Finally was Dodo Gamma, who I genuinely can't find footage of me hunting. Seriously, I've come through all my footage and I can't find any of me fighting them. But when I look at my hunter's notes it says I already have. I guess I did then? Well I'm going to assume they were hard as nails then. So hard I must have forgotten the fight even happened. I decided to try and tackle Uzzur Rathlos next, and I know I said the original Rathlos was no problem earlier on in the video, but man do I hate Azur and Silver Rathlos. Something about their moveset irritates my very core. I faint very quickly due to stun on my first run at Azur, and on my track back up I just give up and decide I'll do him later instead. Fast forward one hour and I put my nose back to the grindstone again. The second fight goes substantially better than the first, ending up slaying him with zero feints, and in only around 8 minutes too. I really feel like Rathalos is a flip of the coin when it comes to if he's infuriatingly hard or surprisingly easy. While I lost all my footage in fighting normal Diablos, I at least have all my footage fighting black Diablos instead to make up for it. Like Rathalos, I've never found these monsters to be that fun to fight. They're the type where if I have to I will, but if I don't, I won't. Black Diablos is no exception, although I'd argue she's more fun to fight than normal Diablos sometimes. No, don't do this move! Well, that's, that's bad. 
Oh, I'm stunned. I'm dead. Very pog. Well, you're saying she's not the hardest of monsters, but man, do I get stunned a lot in this fight. I get super lucky that only one of them results in a faint, though. Next, we deal with world's resident poop collector themselves, Basil Geese. I guarantee you there is no monster who has received more darn quads than they have over the course of Monster Hunter World. I don't know whether I love or hate this monster, but I usually tend to fall on the side of love. Either way, I've never really had a problem fighting them, and this time's no different, even if I can't sharpen. Just to mention it in case you were to notice, these next three hunts are done on my main character who already has these monsters unlocked. Rest assured, she's wearing the exact same gear and weapon I was on Barb, so there should be no real statistical difference between the two. If anything, I forgot to upgrade one of the armor pieces when switching over, technically making my main character's hunt statistically harder. But it's only by a few points, it really shouldn't make a difference. I went for Kira next after switching over, a monster I quite honestly hate to fight. Their impenetrably tough hide couple with paralysis and stuns and all that mess just really gets on your nerves after a while. I end up fainting once during the hunt, but get luckily revived by my palico. The hunt goes smoothly from there up until the very end, where I end up fainting again, and this time my palico isn't there to give me a get out of jail free card. As typical, I climb all the way back up the Coral Highlands, only to smack Kira in a couple of times, and have the hunt complete. Could have saved myself a long trek to the top if I hadn't gone and fainted a couple seconds before their death. We only have two monsters left to hunt, and I saved the best two for last. Devil Ho was honestly not that hard. While I do adore the floppy angry pickle, his moveset has never really given me that much trouble. The most aggravating part of him is how they're always five meters above the ground, leaving nothing but their shins to poke at half the time. Our sharpness doesn't even get close to minimum by the time Pickle becomes one with the brine. At last we reach the final monster of the base game, and I'm sure a lot of you can guess who it is. I've seen dozens of posts, videos, and jokes poking at how difficult and unfair of a monster she is, and I could never really sympathize with them until doing this run. Lunastra is, honestly, the true final boss of the game. She constantly sets you on fire, gives you very little openings, can attack you from across the stage with her fire pits, and has a supernova attack that sometimes feels like you're flipping a coin to survive. Before this run, I had never had a problem fighting Lunastra, but I was shocked at just how difficult she actually was to beat under these restrictions. I don't know if I just lucked out every other time I fought her, but she sure did feel it from my blood this time. On my first attempt, I faint not once, but twice in the first three minutes of the hunt. Granted, the first I got Vigor Wasp revived on, but still, two feints this early on was a very bad sign. By the 15 minute mark, I had completely run out of healing, and I ended up fainting a third time when getting too greedy to use my Palico's Vigor Wasp. At this point, I had to run across the entire map picking up resources, just so I could craft more Mega Potions. It took me almost 10 minutes to grab all the resources I needed, only to end up fainting a fourth and final time in the hunt. This was the run's first quest failed right at the very end. Up until now, we've typically only fainted during a quest once, twice if things go super south, but never did I outright fail a quest prior to this. With a chip on my shoulder, I suck it up and load back in a second time, determined to not let Lunastra stalk me right at the finish line. While it's not too much better than my first attempt, my first faint happens five minutes in this time, consuming the one Vigor Wasp revive I get. It's also worth mentioning that Nergigante loves to invade and fight Lunastra throughout most of this hunt. A smarter player would bring dung pots to counter this, but I couldn't be bothered. I do manage to use Nurkigante as a mobile donker twice, which was fun at least. After 15 minutes of hunting her, she starts limping back to her nest. I take the opportunity to farm some more healing items just to make sure I don't run out midway. Unfortunately, she performs her supernova at what might be the worst possible time she could have, causing me to faint for the second time in the hunt. When I come back, I start using everything at my disposal, nabbing myself a mount and flashing her to try and keep her at bay. After a full 25 minutes in the hunt, she finally goes down, taking just two attempts to bring this quest to a close. So yes, you can beat Monster Hunter World without sharpening, and you can beat every monster in the base game without sharpening as well. Lunastra was by far the hardest monster in the run, with honorable mentions going to Nurkigante and Pink Rathian. 
taking the run that much further by including every other monster was the right amount of oomph it needed, in my opinion. A proper, difficult monster to act as a nice, final challenge. I hope you enjoyed the video. It was a fun run to do, especially while Discord streaming it so people could chime in. I'd greatly appreciate sharing the video around and giving it a like if you wanted to. It's tough trying to break through the suffocating YouTube algorithm. If you're interested in more Monster Hunter, I have a hundred Monster Hunter World VODs on my channel, and a ton of Monster Hunter Rise VODs as well. Finally, you can catch me streaming on my Twitch channel daily, playing all sorts of things. Probably most likely Monster Hunter if you're watching this relatively close to when it's posted. I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you later. Thanks so much for watching.